32. The Spirit and Hope. Romans 8. 24 to 28. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth out infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is in the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 24-28 In these verses we have first, in verses 24 and 25, the hope and expectation of the new humanity described. Faced with the fallen and evil world of the old humanity, we who are in Christ look expectantly for the victory and glorification which awaits us. Second, the Holy Spirit, who works to remedy our weaknesses, is basic to our hope and expectation, and he prays in us and for us. Verses 26 and 27. Third, God's perfect purpose ensures the inevitable realization of our hope and our triumph in and through all things. Verses 28 to 30. God's design and predestination uses all things to accomplish his purpose and our good in him. In verse 24, the word hope, elpis in the Greek, cannot be confused with the non-Christian view of hope as daydreaming. The Old Testament associates hope with waiting on God's assured promises, and the New Testament usage is similar. It is not a vague longing, but an assured dependence on the nature and integrity of God. It is an eschatological word because it rests on the assurance that God has a predestined plan that will come to pass. In terms of this, as Hoffman noted, hope is disciplined waiting and a fundamental renunciation of all calculations of the future because we rest on God's promises not on our longings. Hence, Paul says, For we are saved by hope. No man can be saved by humanistic longings, and what Paul here speaks of is our trust in God's saving work and promises. We believe that the culmination of all things is the general resurrection of the totality of the new creation. We live in the expectancy of ever greater things from God, Abraham hoped against all humanistic hope, Romans 4.18, and is therefore a type of faith. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul associates faith, hope, and love together as the virtues of grace. Bernard Clairvaux said, The soul is more where it loves than where it lives. And the same can be said of our hope. Hope is the trust that God has far more gifts in store for us than we can now see or comprehend. We live thus in terms of the unseen, but an unseen that has God's promise stamped upon it. Because of this hope, we wait in patience for its fulfilment. Verse 24 Our normal and eternally natural condition awaits us, and we gain in patience as we grow in hope. Our patience is the necessary virtue which must accompany hope. We gain endurance in the face of this world's evils because of our hope. Moreover, we are never alone in our patient hope because the Holy Spirit is the inseparable part of our lives. Verse 26. In David's words, When my father and mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Psalm 27.10 Again, He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Hebrews 13.5 
Our inadequacies in prayer are remedied by the Spirit, who prays in us and guides our prayers and thoughts. Our prayers are ignorant. We know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit makes intercessions for us. So fully does the Holy Spirit work with us that His intercession is with groanings which cannot be uttered. We have Paul's amazing statement, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, Ephesians 4.30, which tells us how great is the redemptive love and association of the Holy Spirit with us and within us. This work of the Spirit is an aspect of our renovation and our resurrection life in Him. What the Spirit knows God the Father and God the Son know, for He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 27 We are told, I the Lord search the heart, I try the reins. Jeremiah 17.10 Paul tells us that the whole creation groans and travails, waiting for the great regeneration of all things. We too feel the same expectation and yearn to see it come to pass. The Spirit works so closely in the creation he helped make that he too expresses the same expectancy. In Genesis 1-2 we are told that In the work of creation, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now the Spirit moves in us to remake the whole creation. This verse tells us that the Spirit, as well as the Son, is our intercessor. Moreover, there is a remarkable fact about this intercession, as E. H. Gifford noted. 1. His intercession is in accordance with God's own will and purpose. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, even the deep things of God. 1 Corinthians 2.10 And 2. His intercession is for saints, and saints as such are the special objects of the divine purpose in accordance with which the Spirit intercedes. God, who searches all men's hearts, knows their unspoken desires, as does the Spirit, and God, knowing the mind of the Spirit, can thus, with the Spirit, govern a direction of our lives and make intercession a totally open and known reality. Thus, what we cannot express because it is moving towards formulation in our mind, the Spirit knows already, and so too does the Father. It is a reality they are creating in us. Because God's eternal and perfect purpose is at work in us, it is impossible for the results to be other than good. Verse 28 Our present problems and suffering are real enough, but they are turned into total and perfect good by God's providential government. It is neither men nor things which govern the universe, but only God the Lord. Moreover, there is no possible triumph for evil. God uses all things to create his perfect good. Luther rightly saw Romans 8.28 as a magnificent statement of predestination. It is a sentence, he said, to strangle the prudence of the flesh. This means that our expectation and action must be premised on the Lord and His Word, not on ourselves. Modern man sees himself as the best foundation. For example, money today is totally political. It is a creature of the state. The premise of modern economics is the antithesis of Romans 8.28. It, in effect, reads... The humanistic state makes all things work together for good to them that trust in it. The same is true of contemporary law systems. They are more or less arbitrary creations of man and have no roots in ultimate order. Again, the same is true also of other realms and disciplines. Man is seen as the necessary lord of creation who must build upon himself as his own ultimate standard. The result is a belief in a man-made world which quickly reveals itself as a world of chaos, confusion, 
inflation and trouble. The axiom of faith in a humanistic world is the government will do something, I can do something, or something will be done. Men prefer a faith in man to a faith in God because our actions reveal our faith, and modern man is socialist man. This results, as Joseph Sobran in The Washington Times and Howard Phillips in the April 1985 Conservative Manifesto have noted, in a people who are increasingly the serfs of the US Internal Revenue Service. If we believe in man, we will be ruled by man. If we believe in God, we will be ruled by God. Men who profess to believe in God but who refuse to be ruled by his law are practical atheists. As we have seen, the Holy Spirit is closely associated with true hope, waiting on the Lord and on his assured promises. When we walk in the Spirit, we know that we and the world around us are governed by the triune God. The ground we walk on, the stars above us, the weather and all things in creation are governed by God and his law. If we ourselves are under God and his law through Christ, then all goes well. We live, move and have our being in God's perfect government. For us, then, man and the states playing God is a blasphemous presumption, not a need. If, however, we live in a universe which is a product of chance, then the only tellable government is by man and by the state. Romans 8.28 gives the Christian an amazing security because it declares that, in terms of God's perfect and total government, we can never lose. It also sets forth our security in him. In a world of chance, however, man has no security unless some man-made order provides it. The humanistic alternative to Romans 8.28 is statist security and the humanistic state becomes a security state in its pretentious plans and efforts. Vast sums are expended in the effort to create a status alternative to Romans 8.28. The results, however, are judgments. Instead of godly hope, an assured dependence on God's promises and his nature and integrity, we are left with humanistic hope and insistence that it should be so, when it is not nor can be. The humanistic state offers the politics of hope. Campaigns by candidates offer a hope of change, but change without the critical factor, a change in man, regeneration. Just as pigs breed pigs, Adam's sons breed Adam's image. Genesis 5.3 Instead of a change in man, history sees instead the magnification of his possibilities to do evil. We are not saved by humanistic hope. Humanistic eras thus see the rise of statism and a great longing for security. Because of this lust for security, the humanistic cultures are readily led into slavery, whereas the sons of God create a culture of faith and freedom 